What's good guys, welcome back to the first take and as promised I'm going to knock out another one of these uh, Game of Thrones history and laws. This is season 3, part 1. So yeah, I'm actually really looking forward to this. Learned some interesting things in the last one so I'm just curious to know what new shit they can keep on telling. What shit can they keep on veiling that we didn't already know and there seems to be quite a damn lot man. Like, George R. R. Martin went deep with this world, deep. So let's check this next one out. Valyria was not the first to conquer the world. In the dawn of days, the city of Geese opened its gates and poured forth its legions across the continent of Essos. Jeez. With their lockstep discipline and absolute obedience, they ground entire nations beneath their boots and planted a harpy in every corner of the known world. What they didn't destroy, they chained. Slavery is as old as man, but until the Giscari, it was never an art. The slave lords grew rich and fat as pyramids were raised around them, pleasure houses were filled, and fighting pits were open. Nobody remembers if the waters around Geese had names before the Empire, but ever since, we know them only as Slaver's Bay and the Gulf of Grief. Did they create the Of Geese, however, nothing remains but ruins, where end all great civilizations. Five thousand years ago, Valyrian shepherds stumbled on strange eggs. And within a few generations, an upstart Valyrian freehold rose across the sea. Five times did the Giscari contend with Valyria, and five times did they go down in defeat. For the freehold had dragons, and the Empire had none. The best of their legions burned, the others broke. The brick walls of Geese were pulled down, the streets and buildings turned to ash, and the very fields sown with salt, sulfur, and skulls. Yet the Empire was not wholly destroyed. Astapor, Yunkai, and Marine, once lowly colonies along Slaver's Bay, survived, and even thrived. Valyria had watched the Giscari grow rich and powerful off the backs of conquered peoples, and now the self-styled Freehold wanted its turn. While the Dragon Lords brought the world to heel, the slave markets of their former enemy never lacked for flesh. Lamenting the lost empire, the descendants of old geese grew rich and fat. The doom fell on Valyria, and the Dothraki rose to pillage most of the continent at will. But gold-laden Astapor, Yunkai, and Marine continue as they have for thousands of years, untouched. For even the horse lords understand what the Giscari taught Valyria so long ago. <coughs> what good are slaves without slavers? <sighs> when the doom claimed Valyria, the great freehold fractured into warring cities and upstart nations, ripe for the taking. Out of these swarmed the Dothraki, the horse lords of the plains who feared only defeat and dragons. And now the dragons were all gone. Under the great Karl Temu, they sacked and burnt every town and city in their path. No army could stand against them, because the Dothraki do not stand. The horse lords do not draw up battle lines or hide behind shield walls or layer themselves in armor. The Dothraki charge. Their blades are more scythe and sword, the better to cull the infantry ranks without breaking stride. Even their archers fire from horseback so that advancing or retreating, the arrows never cease. Mongolians, Dothraki, basically. The man who does not ride is no man at all, without honor or same. pride. Is that you the same? When the city of Kohor realized Karl Temu was coming, they strengthened their walls, doubled their own guards, and hired two full companies of swords. The Dothraki were used to glorified farmers with spears, Koho would show them a proper army, with mounted and armored cavalry to match the Horde's own. As an afterthought, the city leaders sent an envoy to Astapor to buy Unsullied. The slavers had always claimed that the Unsullied were the great Giscari legions come again. Few cared. The dragon-burned ruins of old geese were a stark reminder that the age of the foot soldier was over. The envoy had his orders, however, and quickly bought 3,000 Unsullied for the long march back. For Unsullied, do not ride. But while they marched, Kaltemu arrived in Pohor, 
I can imagine how pleased the Carl was to finally face a challenge. By the end of the battle, crows and wolves feasted on what remained of Quohor's heavy horse. Damn. All the cell swords had fled. Yeah, yeah exactly. Quohor knew that the Dothraki would very soon break through the gates to rape, slave, and burn at their pleasure. Yet the next day, Carl Temo woke to find, before the gates, 3,000 eunuchs in formation. Armed with only spears, shields, and spiked helms. The Unsullied had slipped past the Carl's army in the night while the Dothraki feasted. Carl Temo had many times their number and could easily have flanked the small force. But to the Dothraki, men on foot are fit only to be ridden down. Eighteen times the horse lords charged, and eighteen times the Unsullied locked their shields, lowered their spears, and held the line against 20,000 Dothraki screamers. When the Carl's archers rained arrows on them, the Unsullied lifted their shields above their heads Discipline. until the squall passed. And then they held the line. Discipline. In the end, only 600 Unsullied remained, but more than 12,000 Dothraki lay dead, including Carl Temo and all his sons. Ah. A new Carl led the survivors past the city gates, where one by one, each man cut off his braid and threw it down before the feet ah. of the Unsullied. Damn. Defeated and shamed forever. Damn. Since that day, the Unsullied fill the ranks of cities and households wealthy enough or desperate enough. Cell swords fight for gold, knights for glory, and Dothraki for blood. To a man, the Unsullied fight only to obey. With the right master over them, imagine how the forces of chaos would break against their shields. Damn. The conquerors. The Mad Men. The Usurpers. How many Unsullied are left? There's still like thousands of them. I can't remember now. Because they're the ones that are really going to do it for the Daenerys, man. That's what the Red Keep is. The small folk say its colour comes from the blood Aegon spilled to win his crown. <laughs> Fools. Blood doesn't soak into stone. No matter how hard I try. Aegon built his castle of red rock to remind people of the fires he roasted his enemies in. So whenever King's Landing locked up, they'd see the price of defiance. He knew the first rule of kings. Only fear keeps men in line. Fear and punishment. A lesson he taught his son, Maegor. When the builders finally finished the Red Keep, Magor executed them all to keep its secrets safe. Rumor has it, miles of hidden passageways run behind the walls and under the floors. One day I'll have to find them. Traitors and women work in shadows. A king has no need for secrecy. Mm. Now, people name Magor the Cruel, but I doubt any dared in his day. His strength was all too rare in the degenerate Targaryen blood. The simpering Baelor, the Blessed, created the Maiden Vault to imprison his own sisters and save himself from carnal thoughts. Oh. Disgusting. Though, I admit a prince vault could be amusing when Tom and Bors Disgusting. You My favorite place in the Red Keep? Okay, so you were made. The traitors walk, where I mount the heads of my enemies. It's a shame flesh rots so slowly. <sighs> I've almost run out of spikes. The dungeons are also quite nice once you get past the first two levels. A stable for common criminals and private cells for useful highborns. How boring, I know. But then you come to the black cells. No windows, no torches. Just darkness, and whatever you hear in there with you. Here we keep the greatest traitors, until the king is ready for them. And with these, I often like to take my time. But I've heard rumors of an even lower, hidden level, Magor's favorite. Once a man was taken here, he never saw the sun again, nor heard a human voice, nor breathed a breath free of agonizing pain. Varus must know the way, but that overgrown girl pretends not to. 
Maybe he fears I'll make him a victim. Maybe I will. Then again, torture chambers aren't just so... private. Better to punish your enemies where everyone can see and remember. Like that Targaryen who forced his nephew to watch as he fed the boy's traitor mother to a dragon. <clears throat> oh, what I could do with a dragon. Even Ares, fool as he was, knew to burn men alive with an audience to spread the terror far and wide across his kingdoms. Of course, I know my favorite place now. When I sit on the Iron Throne, high in the Red Keep, all of Westeros scuttles below me, like insects, waiting for my heel to land. You got yours, motherfucker. You got yours. Ha! Mud men. Ha! Bog devils. Those are just the most pleasant names our fellow northerners have for us. The Kranig men who live Ooh. in the swamps of the neck. Okay, this is new. Because we do not live in castles like them. Because we do not farm like them. Because we are not tall or rich like them. But through our veins flows the same blood of the first men. And, at times, <coughs> maybe something more. We still live much as they did, on floating islands in houses of thatch and woven reeds. Uh, Ewoks. We fish hunt and tell our children of our heroes. The knight of the laughing tree who fought in the year of the false spring. The last marsh king who challenged the Starks and lost his crown and his daughter. And other stories, older still, since lost to the world. We haven't seen enough of these people. We need the net was not always a swamp. In the dawn age, it was as dry and fertile as the rest of the north. But during the war with the first men, the children of the forest brought down the hammer of waters on the neck, trying to break Westeros in two. When the waters finally receded, they left the bogs and swamps we know today. Many of the first men decided to fight on, but my ancestors wisely chose to heed the children's power and advance no farther. They beat their swords into frog spears and fish hooks, and settled a land forever devastated by the folly of war. Unlike the rest of Westeros, we keep no garrisons and raise no soldiers for petty spats with our neighbors. Our land protects its own. An outsider will find in the neck an endless morass of suck holes, quicksands, and green grass that looks solid to the unwary eye, but turns to water the instant you tread on it. If you're lucky enough to be armored, you'll only drown inside your own steel. If you're not, you get to meet what swims in that water. Ooh. Serpents and monstrous lizard lions with teeth like daggers and never enough to eat. Lizard lion. Don't worry. Only your horse will live long enough to feel their poisons burning through it. If you somehow survive all this, you may find that a well-placed dart can be as deadly as any blade. Not that you'll see us blowing it your way. Since the fall of the last Marsh King, House Reed has ruled the neck beneath the banner of a black lizard lion on a grey-green field. We are not wealthy, powerful, or known even to our own countrymen. Our home, Greywater Watch, is no castle you've ever seen. And seeing it once does not mean you'll ever find it again. For Greywater Watch moves. Many would-be conquerors have died trying to find us. With war all around and our Stark Lord besieged on all sides, many more will doubtless soon try. They will look at us on a map and see a stranglehold for the North. And they will forget that the sea itself once entered the Neck, and not all of it returned. We need to see this shit on the show, man. They, they haven't touched that shit. Like the Starks, the blood of House Bolton runs back to the First Men. Singers call those times the Age of Heroes. A mask for a savage world that bred savage men. Bolton's. The Lannisters swindled their enemies. The Storm Kings hammered them. And the Starks cut off their heads. In such company as this, were the Boltons really so... Delicate. Unlike some other houses, my ancestors own the Bolton words. Our blades are sharp. They passed down not a Valerian greatsword, but a knife. 
honed and thin enough to fit between the topmost layer of skin and the tissue below. And to peel. For as we all learned as children, a naked man has few secrets, a flayed man none. In those dark days, they say that some of my more willful forebearers would even wear their enemies' skins as cloaks. But no such tokens remain, if they ever existed. Wow. So they were hanging in some secret room in the Dreadfort, as Ugh. old wives and fools insist. Ugh. I suspect my house itself was responsible for spreading such rumors in the first place. Few weapons are as effective as terror. And this was an age of war. House against house. Brother against brother. The Iron Men were on the rise, and never far from our shores. We must have seemed ripe for the taking. Too busy fighting each other to deal with the raiders as they deserved. Thus the Starks took it upon themselves to unify the North. Under them. They drove the pirates out of White Knife and claimed the eastern coast and married the Marsh King's daughter for the neck. The Stark wrestled for Bear Island and won. Or so they say. Silly stories. Blood and steel on the North. The Starks had the most of both. After years of war, my ancestors gave up their barbaric practices and bent the knee to their new kings. Thus has Bolton became what we are today. Loyal bannermen and staunch ally to the Starks. And the second greatest house in the north. Not quite. The Westerlands are all bounded by three natural defenses. Mountain, sea and forest. Necessary barriers when the land is as rich as ours. From our mines come the gold and silver that fuel the rest of Westeros. From Lannisport, our largest city, come the most skillful gold and silversmiths in the land. Yet geography alone is not strength. Have the we seen this would have been sacked and pillaged for thousands of years if it hadn't been for the men who ruled it. My family, House Lannister. According to legend, we trace our descent to Lam the Clubber, a trickster of the Dawn Age, who swindled the Casterlies out of Casterly Rock, their ancient castle. A childish story, but not without merit. One, a mind can and should be a weapon in a man's arsenal. Two, Lam must have been clever enough not to rely solely on his wits. After all, where today is House Casterly? Three, by keeping the Casterly name on the castle, Lan reminded the world of the price of getting in his way. <laughs> the Reigns ignored all these lessons. Not content with being the second richest family, they sought to challenge the first, mine. My father had put up with their insults and disrespect. When I came of age, I led our army to teach them what they should have known. Some people say I was too harsh, that eradicating every member of their family was not necessary. But now, there are no bannermen as loyal to their lord as the Westerlands to us. If any lord bridles at our authority, I have only to send a singer with a harp, and he falls back into line. Because I will not have our lords squabble amongst themselves, like the lords of the Riverlands, or hide in their castles like the lords of the Vale, each of our bannermen contributes a unique skill that furthers the whole of the Westerlands. As for game, because every lord needs a beast from time to time. Sir Gregor strikes terror into the hearts of our enemies and our friends. So too does if he wasn't so arrogant, he would have been the smartest person in the show. House Payne, who provides us loyal servants. Sir Illin Payne was once captain of my household guard, until the Mad King heard him boast that I ran the Seven Kingdoms, which I did. The Mad King tore out Sir Illin's tongue, making him especially well suited to later become the King's Justice. Apparently these days, a younger Payne also serves my degenerate son, Tyrion. 
as Leffer, who guards the Golden Tooth. The Eastern Pass through the mountains and the all too frequent chaos of the Seven Kingdoms. Though after Rob Stark's recent incursions, perhaps we need a new gatekeeper. Fools look at the Westerlands and see gold. Fools see our wealth and call it strength. Gold is just another rock. The Westerlands are strong because of House Lannister. From strong leadership comes unity. From unity comes power. Shame he didn't live longer, man. I did like that character. Tarth has lulled many a novice sailor into complacency. Our lush island sits on calm blue water like an emerald set into a sapphire. You would never guess that such a vision is only the sheath hiding the blade of Shipbreaker Bay. Brienne's With its family. treacherous tides, unpredictable gales, and sharp rocks lurking just below the water's surface. The storms that blow through the bay water the Kingswood and Rainwood, two of the great forests of Westeros. And they give the Stormlands their name. Even without our weather, we have more than earned our name in strife. Oh, so that's where... The first Storm King, Durham. Started his reign by declaring war on the gods themselves. He loved the daughter of the sea god and the wind goddess, but they forbade the union. At their wedding, the gods unleashed their might, pulling down his hold and killing all of Durin's family and guests, though his wife shielded him. Durin vowed to rebuild, and when he did, the gods again destroyed his home. His counselors begged him to retreat inland, but he would not abandon his war. Finally, with the council of the Children of the Forest, or perhaps a young Bran the Builder, Durin raised a seventh castle that, try as they might, and still do, the wind and sea gods could not tear asunder. Durin took the name God's Grief and called his new home Storm's End. Having beaten the waters to the east, the Storm Kings turned their gaze to more practical enemies, the Reach, Riverlands, and Dawn. For thousands of years, the Storm Kings fought the Gardener Kings of the Reach and various families of Dawn for control of the Dornish marches just below the Red Mountains. The fighting didn't stop until Dawn married into the Seven Kingdoms a mere hundred years ago. But still, the houses of the Stormlands, such as the Dondarians, guard the Bone Way, the mountain pass into the marches, Darian. against any Dornish incursion. The Storm Kings had greater luck to their north at first. They took the trident from the River Kings and built an empire that stretched as far as the neck. But then the Ironborn swarmed out of their islands and pushed the Storm Kings out of the Riverlands. No doubt the Ironborn intended to expand their empire into the Stormlands. Before they had a chance, Aegon Targaryen landed with his dragons. While Aegon burned the kings of the Iron Islands, the Rock and the Reach, his fiercest commander, and rumored bastard brother, or his Baratheon set out to subdue the Stormlands. No matter how fierce a warrior he was, no one could have ended his task. Storm's end had seen thousands of years of war and never fallen. But Argonac, the Storm King, chose not to barricade himself behind its walls and gave Ori's the battle he must have hoped for. Ori's slew Argonac and took Argonac's castle, kingdom, daughter, Sigil and House Worlds. House Baratheon became the Lord of the Stormlands. Targaryen rule quieted the Stormlands for the most part, until Robert rebelled against the Mad King. His first challenge came not from the Crown, but from his own bannermen, who tried to join forces against him. Robert struck first, defeating three armies in a single day at Summerhall. The victory cemented Robert's control of the Stormlands, and he was able to march on the Reach and Riverlands with no enemy to his rear. Yet not all of Robert's bannermen sided with him. Sir Barristan the Bold came from the Stormlands, but as the pre-eminent member of Aerys Kingsguard and greatest knight in the realm, Sir Barristan remained loyal. After Robert's decisive victory on the Trident, Robert sent his own maesters to care for his countryman Sir Barristan, who had suffered grievous wounds whilst fighting so hard to kill him. Later, when the Kingslayer betrayed Aerys, Robert pardoned Sir Barristan and even took him onto his own Kingsguard. 
When Robert lifted Mace Tyrell's ill-managed siege of Storm's End and returned to his ancestral home, he realized the dream of all the Storm Lords before him, to rule the Seven Kingdoms. Then Robert died, and his brother Stannis killed their other brother, the noble King Renly, with black magic. And then he... Now the Stormlands again live up to their name. With so many houses burnt on the Blackwater and others currying favor with the Lannisters to seize the survivors' lands. Renny could have saved us. If only I could have saved him. But I will teach Stannis a lesson he should have learned growing up in the Stormlands. As lightning gives way to yep. thunder, so too must murder lead to vengeance. Well done, girl. You did your job. Growing up, my sister Sansa loved stories with princesses and knights, but I always wanted to be scared. When my turn came, I would ask old Nan to tell us of magic and monsters. Wogs. Long ago, when the world was new, the children of the forest sang the song of the earth, and the earth listened. Magic was strong in those days, and the children could commune with all the beasts of the forest, streams and air. The greatest of them could even leave their bodies to hunt, swim, and fly in the skins of animals. They were the first wargs. Then, the first men came with fire and sword. They burned the weirwoods and cut down the children. Calling on dark magic, the children raised the sea and shattered the land bridge that the first men had crossed into dawn. When that failed, the children brought down the hammer of waters upon the neck, flooding and transforming it into the bog it is today. After peace came, the two races shared the land and the children's gods for thousands of years. Now comes the good part. Nobody knows how or why, but the magic of the children began to emerge in men. Maybe one child in a thousand would be born in a warg. Fewer still would be born with the sight. Old man would not speak of it, and Maester Lewin never believed in it. But with it, the children could know of events far away and even those still to come. Some say the sight was the children's most powerful and terrible secret, and helped turn the tide during the long night. Magic has since fled our world. Among the small folk, any child suspected of being a war will be left out to die. Beyond the wall, though, a careless hunter might still find his prey as claws and teeth. A man's mind to guide them. For the wildlings have a different idea of monsters. But even wildlings keep their distance from a wall. Because, and here, old man would lean in close and whisper. How can you tell if the man is wearing the beast? Or the beast is wearing the man? Now, old man has no more tales, and Maester Lewin will never scoff again. That's fine. I don't like scary stories anymore. Because I'm in one. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember there was a wag with the wildlings in the book? The boy, looking out from my father's castle. I thought the sun could never set on the north, so vast did it seem. Part of me still does. The North is by far the largest of the Seven Kingdoms, and can fit the other six inside it. Not that the others care. Cold and damp. That's how the Southerners see the North. But without the cold, a man can't appreciate the fire in his hearth. Without the rain, a man can't appreciate the roof over his head. Let the South have its sun, flowers and affectations. We Northerners have home. Mine was once Winterfell, the ancient seat of my father's family, House Stark, who have ruled the North since the first men and were once the kings of winter. Your mothers. Growing up, Lady Catelyn made sure I knew I wasn't a Stark, no matter how much blood I shared with her true-born children. <laughs> but where their name rules over the North, mine is the North. Snow. Snow. Our land stretches from the wall down to the neck, a narrow land that divides us from the rest of Westeros. Legend has it 
that the children of the forest flooded it in their war against the first men. If that's true, every Northman owes them a debt of gratitude. The swamps of the Neck are as good as the wall for keeping out unwelcome armies. And if the swamps don't deter you, the Kranog men should. Small, shy people who rarely leave those swamps and who follow House Reed, the gatekeepers of the North, and among the most important and loyal bannermen of House Stark. Also a bit strange. I heard their other felt he once as a child. It's like no other lords, ancient and dark. They swear by earth and water, by bronze and iron, and by ice and fire. Where House Reed holds the gate to the north, House Manderley holds the port, White Harbor. The closest thing to a southern city we have, governed by the closest thing to a southern family we have. Generations ago, the Mandalays were driven from the Reach, but the Starks gave them their land in return for fealty. Now, White Harbor is the richest city of the North, and the Mandalays the richest family. Not in gold and silver like their southern counterparts, but in fish, grain, and trade. As for the other great northern houses, the Starks brought them into the fold during the Age of Heroes. The Stark wrestled an ironborn for Bear Island and gave it to the Mormons. The Stark granted a keep and land to a younger son, Carlon, in return for putting down a rebellion. His family then grew up into the Car Starks. Starks fought the wildlings and their kings beyond the wall beside the umbers of Last Earth, thus earning their fealty. Boltons. Back then they were the bane of the North. A few were even rumored to wear their enemies' flayed skins as clogs. But after centuries of war, they too bent the knee. Mm. And so House Stark became the kings in the north, but never forgot that they weren't the north. When Aegon and his dragons landed on Westeros, the kings of the Rock and the Reach sent all their men to die to defend their crowns. Torrent Stark knelt to spare his people the same fate. He placed duty above pride. Just as my brothers in the Night's Watch had done for thousands of years at the Wall. Many think of it as the end of the world, but it's not. I've seen how the land stretches much farther than any man knows, into the land of always winter where the White Walkers came from during the long night. After the first men and the children of the forest beat them back, Brand and the Builder raised the wall and set up the Night's Watch to guard the realms of men. He gave us our oath. Our castles and the gift. Brandable, the lands Brandable. behind the wall whose farmers and crops sustain us. Southerners may now mock my black brothers as thieves, rapers, and worse. And not without cause. But the North remembers why we are there. And if we fall, the South will get a very harsh and very cold reminder. Boom. Tempted to get a map. Like a giant map of not just Westeros, but the, the the whole known world. Even though um, George R. R. Martin was even saying, I think he was called to saying that there's still a lot more. That like we still only he's only really showed us still just small parts. There's still a bigger world. Yes, there's, there's more shit going on like west of Westeros that we haven't really gotten into. But I'd like a map just to kind of help remind me of the geography of the whole thing, man. But to seeing it and hearing all these families, you kind of forget sometimes. Like um, Brienne's family, I completely forgot about them. So it's nice hearing how they fit into this whole thing. But again, what they mentioned with the, the Baratheon, which was like a bastard brother of the top of one of the Targaryens, it makes me, it reminds me that that kid, that bastard son who ran away with Ares, not Ares, what am I saying? Who ran away with um, Arya in season one, and the chubby kid. He has to have some sort of. He has to have something to do with what's going to happen. I believe that he wasn't just there as a wasted character because they made such a big deal out of him. That I want to believe that he, he's going to amount to something. I do. I don't want to just believe that he's just a wasted character that was there and then just pff, for no reason. Because he's a Baratheon and if the Baratheons are connected with a sliver of that Targaryen blood, I don't know how, in what bigger context it's going to play. But kind of like with John having little Targaryen blood in him, I don't know. It's gonna amount to something. Something with the dragons, maybe when they come, 
they show respect to him, they don't want to burn him away. I don't know, I, just, I don't know how it'll fit and what it'll mean, but I want to believe it'll mean something. So I guess time will tell, man. But pff, only seven episodes, I believe it was, this coming season. And then I think seven. I don't know, I don't know if there's even space for him, man. It's been a long time. It's been a long time since he's there. Maybe the writers think that, you know, what's the point in bringing him back? Everyone's forgotten about him. Maybe. What's your theories guys? Let me know. Probably get to another one of these in a day or two. But yeah. Right, if you like the video, please subscribe. I am Ed Reese and this has been my first take to Game of Thrones Histories and Lore. Season 3 part 1 and overall I think this is like part 5. All of them together. Yeah. Well, yeah guys.